How in the world can we ever react in a way that's exaggerated given what we have suffered in this country for over 400 years? This belief that whites have a right to live separate and not to integrate was very strong, strong nationally, but particularly strong in Oregon. I have always thought that racism in this country should be considered as a mental illness, because that is exactly what it is. In Portland, a treadmill of frustration. It's a slap in the face. It's a slap in the face of the entire community. Would ignite a generation. It was our turn to fight for those things that were right and just and equitable. And unite a community. We don't want every woman that walks the streets in Albina to be considered a prostitute. We don't want every young man that walks the streets to be, con to be considered a dope peddler. We were an occupation army. Our job was not to interact or solve problems. It was to suppress things. This is a story of struggle and triumph. If you destroy the children of a community, you have essentially destroyed the future of that community, and that was understood. And voices raised for human rights. Too often we have sat passively while the school district shuttled our children all over town like cattle. The time has come for this to stop. We were going to win. We did not doubt that at any point. By the late 1950s, federally funded urban renewal projects had been gaining traction across the United States, including Portland. In the heart of Portland, Oregon's near north side, a two square mile area live over 15,000 Americans. This is Albina, Portland's Negro ghetto. Despite a cohesive community, decades of racist policies had determined its future. People are ghettoized into a particular space or place, okay? And that means we designate Albina as the place where African Americans live, we allow more vice activities to occur there. We don't provide the same policing services, garbage services, education services, park maintenance services, housing maintenance. We neglect and disinvest in that area. High unemployment permeated the district. Low paying service jobs prevailed and reports of crime and violence saturated the media. You know, they called Albina tombstone territory. Very funny. It's like it's the Wild West. Even when our preachers go to the city and say, please help us make our neighborhoods nice, and the mayor says, no, as long as it's in your area, it's OK. So blacks saw themselves as an internal colony or a domestic colony ruled by outsiders, kept in a place via segregation, and subject to the powers that be of the ruling institutions. The city government did not do things in cooperation with African Americans. We were invisible. In 1956, Portland voted to build the Memorial Coliseum in one of the few areas African Americans had been allowed to live. More than 450 homes were raised decimating the southern end of the community. The construction of the East Bank Freeway demolished more than a hundred more. Displaced black families were shifted further north and east. The recently established Portland Development Commission targeted central Albina in 1962. We foresee this area as nothing more than an industrial area without residential use. So I'm saying the wheels are turning already in the minds of people that we're not going to let this slum or ghetto stay here. That's why black people saw it as Negro removal. It's, it's time to go. We need this land for improved uses. The city soon approached Emanuel Hospital about expanding its Albina campus. 
The plans would involve clearing large tracts of land. As the project moved forward, additional funding emerged from the new Model Cities program, part of President Johnson's War on Poverty. The way the Model Cities operated was supposedly structured around community involvement. Grassroots people who would be involved in community organizations that would make decisions about where the money would go and how it would be spent. A citizens planning board voiced concerns about the displacement of area residents, but had little power. Every property owner here is looking for the bulldozer. If they can bypass Model City, then we, as members on the board, have no voice. The Emanuel Project, that was kept away from citizens by the Portland Development Commission because you got to remember that urban planners of that day didn't really believe that citizens should be able to stop high-level developments like this. If the hospital needs it, if we're going to get a huge amount of money from the feds to improve our city, to clear the slum, we know what's best for the community, and this is what we do. News of the expansion project took many area residents by surprise. When the larger community tells a smaller part of the community that it's necessary to move them from their homes because the land is needed for progress or improvement, the total community has the obligation to see that those being displaced can be moved with dignity and without suffering financial loss. 22 blocks in the area were demolished. The heart of the black community, that, that intersection of Russell and Williams Avenue, was destroyed. Right? Those black businesses were destroyed. Across the street from the hospital, a neighborhood landmark found its final resting place. That dome was preserved in a park, but you see that you were moved out. You had no choice. To me, that's a symbol of power. This is why there's lingering distrust. Families who lost their homes received compensation to purchase comparable houses and given about 90 days to move. You can move in a place in Poland. I mean, black people. Yeah, it was just hard to find a place to live. I was looking in the sunny Oregonia, and we found a house we thought we could get. And they told us to come on out. So we got in the car and we went out there. They probably could realize who we were before we got there, because they can tell by your voice who you are. And so when we got there, they didn't even show up. The Glovers and some of their friends scattered to Portland's east side. I'm not angry. You can't live angry for a long time and be healthy, but you think about it for a long time. Ironically, federal funds would run out before Emanuel finished the last phase of its construction. And the land was cleared in 1970. <laughs> this is 2014, it's still empty. Today, about 36,000 African Americans call Portland home, but most no longer live in the Albina area. Albina just became ripe for gentrification. As the rest of Portland became too expensive, Albina was close in, good housing stock, be and cheap, became attractive to people who weren't so afraid of living in diverse communities. The people that I used to see all the time that I haven't seen for a year, I see them now when I go to a funeral. And they say, well, I say, where are you living now? I live in the numbers. That's where most of the African Americans live now, in that area out there. Gentrification isn't um, an event. It's a process. They're decisions made by uh, people intentionally that have the result of displacement. And when you look at who's making the decisions, you have to look at, well, who's missing from the table? Today at Emanuel Hospital, an exhibit acknowledges the past. 
on a wall that once faced for many a street of dreams. It meant a lot to me, my home did, you know? You can be in a house, but sometimes a place where you are, it just does something for your lifestyle, you know? That's the way I was when I was at Emmanuel. We lift our hands. We lift our hands in the sanctuary. We lift our hands to give you the glory. We lift our hands to give you the praise. The church has always been the institution that was about lifting as we climbed. Jesus, Jesus, we give you the praise. The ministers were huge. I mean, those were the most respected figures um, within our communities. And again, a lot of people looked up to them for advice. They were very important to a lot of people. Vancouver Avenue First Baptist Church, in the heart of the Albina District, was founded in 1944 and led by the Reverend O.B. Williams for nearly 50 years. He was a young, spry Baptist preacher who had a lot of energy. He was a visionary. People connected to him. Most churches typically had about 200 to 300 people as members, and his church was close to 1,200 people. So you can just imagine the impact he had on the community's voice. Vancouver Avenue became a huge meeting place for a lot of activities around the Urban League and uh, activities around the NAACP. So he became sort of the driving force behind that. It really gave people place and purpose. It brought unity. Mount Olivet Baptist Church first organized in 1907. By chance, we have gone on our own selfish way and have not bothered to uh, bring to mankind the eternal truths of Jesus Christ. In 1964, 52-year-old John Jackson arrived from Pittsburgh to become its pastor. He liked people and he liked helping people and he knew how to listen to people. He had a, a way about him that people knew he was sincere, whether he was up in the pulpit doing a sermon or whether he was out there on the corner talking to the kids that were getting ready to fight. Courageous, funny as hell, funny as hell, a dry sense of humor, a great intellect, was able to read probably Greek, Latin, Hebrew, I think, very much involved in the Civil Rights Movement, knew Martin Luther King before most of the country knew him. In the early 1960s, the Reverend Jackson and the Reverend Williams would join forces to establish the Albina Ministerial Alliance that would help unify African-American pastors in a powerful voice. Times were changing, and this was a generation of people who wanted to take it to a whole nother place. And these people just galvanized themselves and, and did everything in their power to make change for a new generation that was coming after them. The 1960s would dramatically change the civil rights movement in America. President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act in 1964. This Civil Rights Act is a challenge to all of us to go to work in our communities and our states, in our homes and in our hearts, to eliminate the last vestiges of injustice. The Voter Registration Act followed in 65, and young African Americans began demanding their rights as first-class citizens. We're not going to plead with you to give us our rights. We feel we should have them, and we demand to have them right now. That was kind of the tenor of the 1960s and that younger generation that begins to emerge. I watched the civil rights movement unfold in my living room. And I think the thing that planted the seeds of righteous anger in me, and I don't think I'll ever forget it, 
1961, Bull Connor and the Ku Klux Klan outside of Anniston, Alabama, bombed the bus carrying the Freedom Riders. That was the most savage attack I had ever seen in my life. It wasn't time in my mind to turn the other cheek anymore. It was the time to stand up and speak up about change now. In 1967, Beverly Williams was tutoring young black men through a church organization. They were concerned about unemployment in Irving Park, and all they see is white faces, and they want some of those jobs. Well, my idea was to pile into my Volkswagen and drive down to City Hall to talk to the head of the Parks Department about jobs for these young African-American men. And I get told I have to make an appointment. Undeterred, Williams, along with several others, returned soon after to meet directly with the mayor. We are here. We will be reckoned with. I think that it was, how dare you? How dare you? And what are you griping about? Well, we were talking about the unemployment. We were talking about the poor housing conditions. We were talking about things that had existed in black communities for years. We were talking about, you know, 720 police officers on the force in Portland, Oregon, 1% of them black. In the white community, the police were the protectors from chaos. They were the thin blue line that kept uh, law and order in place in a society. They were officer friendly. Uh, who walked your children to school as they held their hand. But in the black community, the police were considered to be an army of occupation. You're being observed. You're being patrolled by outsiders who are constantly thinking of you as suspicious and prone to committing crime. Some of those people in my English class at CCAP had never, ever been to downtown Portland. They felt isolated. They felt like a colony in the city. And that's why I think things were so bad with the police. I became a, a police officer in 1966. And the reason I did, and it's like I came to find out much later, is that most cops went on for the very same reason I did. You wanted to help people. And then when I, as an officer, began to work in Northeast Portland, the Albina area, I saw directly how African Americans were treated. I saw people beat up that I did not think should have been beat up. I heard in the locker rooms and out on the street the N-word repeatedly. And it was addressing African Americans or just talking between cops. But the prevailing culture said, shut up and mind your own business. Remember, when you're in a tight spot, you depend upon us and we depend upon you. In 1967, the Vietnam War was escalating. In the U.S., deadly race riots had erupted in Newark and Detroit. And in Portland, growing frustration among young African Americans turned a political rally in Irving Park violent. At the time, Portland was very unprepared for anything like this. We didn't have any riot gear. What I was told is, bring whatever long gun you have from home, and we're going to be going out on patrol. So I borrowed my brother's rifle, and they assigned four officers to a car. And we had, everybody had these long guns, so we'd stick them out the window, because you don't want to point them at each other. So they would be out the window, and you'd see this police car going down the street with these guns sticking out. During the night, I can remember standing on what was then Union Avenue in Fremont, and every building I could see was on fire. And I could hear the pop, pop of guns. And pretty soon I saw this group of young black men, and they looked at me, and I'll have to skip the obscenity part, but basically, we're gonna kill you, pig. And they were talking to me, and I'm thinking, what, what did I do to these people? Well, it's not what I did, it's what that uniform did in, at other times and places. And 
quite frankly, it scared the hell out of me. In 1969, Portland streets burned again. Last night, there were 13 fire bombings. We're going to meet sternness with sternness. Whatever the law allows us to do to enforce the law, we're going to use. After that period, I, I stopped using the phrase law enforcement to describe a police officer because I realized that too many police officers saw their job solely as enforcers of the law rather than peacekeepers and problem solvers. As the relationship between the black community and the police continued to deteriorate, dynamic forces within the community were changing too. The old black leadership thought that this younger generation was approaching things completely in the wrong manner, and so they felt that their objectives could best be achieved by a return to the kind of policies and strategies that the older generation was most comfortable with. The NAACP, the Urban League, did some really wonderful things in the areas of employment, in housing, and made a difference in the lives of many African Americans. But I think they were not, at that time, as I could see it, speaking for the poorest of the poor, the African Americans who were trapped in the ghettos. They worked within the system to create change. They were patient. Oh, my God, were they patient. And they were polite. You know, Portland, we're polite. But when black power came in, it was in your face politics with a jagged edge. And we didn't necessarily care how we said it. And we didn't care how you responded to it. There was a tremendous struggle for power and influence uh, in the black community. Who was going to have the legitimate right to lead blacks into the future? Revolution has come for the first time. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense had been founded in Oakland, California in 1966. The Black Panthers were an organization that insisted on their right to self-defense, which is an American tradition. But in uh, the mouths and the hands of a black organization became the most threatening possibility that American society could envision. Two years later, in 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. The church was packed from uh, top to bottom. There were lots of people outside listening on loudspeakers um, of what was going on inside. It was a citywide service that honored his legacy in, in a huge way. That's the night I crossed over. That's the that night, that, that night I gave up all hope of America, right, that, that night. I, I was about 25 or 26 years old, and, 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 and from then on, nonviolence just didn't work, didn't work for me no more, yeah. A summer evening in 1968 changed college-bound Percy Hampton as well. About 7 o'clock at night, Saturday evening, I was walking over to the store, and these two cops pulled up to me, and... Um, it was straight harassment. I said, boy, where are you going? I said, first off, I'm not a boy, but I'm going to the store. And then he said something like, oh, smart mouth, and do you have any ID on you? And it escalated into, um, they said I assaulted the police officer, disorderly conduct, and resisting arrest. So I went to jail that night. Kent Ford and Percy Hampton took the lead in starting a Black Panther chapter in Portland. Organizing from, from, the grassroots, from the grassroots all the way up. And in the summer of 1969, out on bail, after being beaten by police and charged with riot, Ford told the entire city. I called a press conference on a, on a courthouse steps and announced, and announced that we weren't going to take these fascist tactics anymore, that we are going to defend ourselves. I was the, the person that had the newspapers every week. We started off, that was the way that we started out making money for the Black Panther Party was selling a newspaper. I was the distribution manager. Because we had to read these papers every week. Required reading. This was our backbone uh, for the Black Panther Party. To become official, 
Panther chapters across the country were required to start survival programs in their communities. It was that desperate because we knew the kids were going to school hungry. Wasn't, no food stamps or nothing in, and they couldn't learn. You can't learn hungry, you know what I mean? By late 1969, breakfast was served at Highland Church of Christ. We served nutritional breakfasts every day, pancakes, sausages, uh, ham and eggs, uh, you, you name it. We served it, you know. And we kind of went around to these different organizations and got them to donate the food. We ended up with about 100 and some kids every day that we was feeding there. So some of the old timers from the neighborhood, you know, they would just come up and watch the kids eat and stuff, and you could see tears coming from their eyes. That's, that's how powerful it was. After we started one, then the school district decided they were going to set up one, but the kids still came to ours because we, we had better food. The Panthers opened a free clinic in early 1970. We named the clinic after Fred Hampton, who was the chairman of the Chicago chapter of the Black Panther Party, who got killed in bed by the FBI and the police department. In the area that we worked in down, down on Williams and Russell, you know, that, that was the core area. And, and uh, all the doctors and nurses, you know, they just came out of their own humanitarian effort to, to help, you know what I mean? We didn't care whether they're black or white, brown or whatever. As long as they came to the clinic, we served them. Besides basic care, they provided testing for lead poisoning and sickle cell anemia. We did over 3,000 sickle cell tests going going into the public schools doing a sickle cell test too. And they started a free dental clinic, the first in the area. The kids were very apprehensive and scared when they came in. Because number one, they'd never been to a dentist. Frequently they had two or three abscessed teeth, maybe a, one or two missing teeth already, cavities in almost every tooth. They'd be cowering in the chair and I'd lean over and go, and they just brighten up and look, <laughs> you know, and uh, and they felt relieved. I think this was what we call serve, serve the people by their soul. When the Black Panther Party began to create those kind of alternative institutions, I think they became even more threatening to white society than they had been as simply a militant organization. By serving real needs of real black people, it gave them a legitimacy and a power that maybe the moderates could not compete with. By the late 1960s, the National Panther headquarters was self-destructing in discord and violence. Meanwhile, the Portland Panthers had managed to keep a somewhat lower profile. I was one of the ones that didn't feel comfortable trying to carry a gun, especially if you're trying to protest something with the police around. But the Portland Panthers, never more than about 50 strong, walked a fine line in the community. According to police reports at the time, several businesses feared retaliation if they failed to donate food or supplies to the Panther programs. Never, no, never. Under no circumstances, we never charged with extortion. We did say that you live in this community, you make your money in this community, you need to donate something to this community. In the late 1960s, Panther activities were under intense scrutiny. The FBI, led by J. Edgar Hoover, was carrying out covert domestic surveillance through its counterintelligence program, COINTELPRO. Agents and informants worked with local police to undercut organizations they considered a threat to national security. They called us thugs and crazies and I tried to stay as, as underground as I possibly could because I know FBI knew where I lived. I lived on campus, but I'm always over at my mom's house. Uh, and so FBI would show up about every three to four months. I knew it was them. They were in this black car with a black suit and a white tie, two white guys together with dark glasses on. I'm saying, FBI. We didn't find, find this out until years later. They sent letters to every doctor in the Monoma County Medical Society asking them not to volunteer at the clinic. The city of Portland, the police department, the federal government was all pissed off at us. And to this day, that's why we have breakfast programs in the school, because to, for them, 
The only way that they could stop this by is by starting their own breakfast program to counteract what we got. We changed Portland. Yes, we did. I have kids come up to me telling me I used to feed them at the breakfast program. They used to come to the clinics and stuff. The families used to come to the clinics and stuff like that. And then, and, and then the, the, that's reward enough for me right there. We say all power to the people. Well, the people have the power. All it takes is for us to organize and show them how to use it. I thought black power was necessary, and it brought about black is beautiful. It brought more attention to our cultural uh, uh, history. It, we were defining for ourselves who we were and not relying on the stereotypes to do it. I always considered being positively black different than being negative towards whites. The point was to instill greater pride and appreciation in ourselves for ourselves. And it wasn't always interpreted like that. In 1975, Charlotte Rutherford was attending Portland State University and active with the Black Student Union. That year, actions by the police sparked outrage in the community. At one six-month interval, we had shot and killed four black men. The fourth was 17-year-old Ricky Johnson. In the community, they were saying, this is just, this is a classic example of the police out of control no accountability, and I could see their point of view, and I understood it, but there was no mechanism in place at the time to sort of breach that distrust. We were angry, angry to say the least, and at a place where somebody has to answer for something, because each of the shootings had been found justifiable with no public review. It was all internal reviews, and very little information came out other than it was justified, which didn't satisfy anybody. The issues had become, uh, in our minds, uh, so egregious at that point. You couldn't sit on the sidelines and let them continue to unfold in the way that they seemed to be unfolding. Activists on campus and off marched to City Hall in protest and met with the chief of police. If the police were completely aware of the robbery attempt the Young brothers were allegedly planning, why didn't they simply surround the house and order all inside to come out? And they demanded something never granted before in Portland, a public jury of inquest. We felt uh, it was in the interest of the uh, police officer, it was in the interest of the Portland Police Bureau, it was in the interest of the community that uh, we have it publicly held because a grand jury, of course, as you know, those proceedings are secret. Very tense and a whole lot of dissatisfaction when we came out of there. It was like, wow, we thought we were going to get answers, but we still don't have answers to a lot of questions. The jurors predictably returned a verdict of justifiable homicide. At least it was a public inquest where people got to see and hear what was being said, which had never happened before. I think that the community now is going to, to take a look at this and to go back and to, to organize and to see what we can do to, to make sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen again. Organized protests would serve the black community well in conflicts of a different nature to come. The premise of busing is in its rawest form, a school that's predominantly black is incapable of achieving academic excellence. It was a, a bankrupt, illicit, insulting theory that the way in which you address this is just move children around, when what these children need is great instruction, teachers who believe in them, and they will do well. By 1960, four schools in the Albina district were more than 90 percent black. In the South, the school board would say, well, black kids just can't go to school with white kids. In the North and in Portland, they didn't have to do that. All you had to do was say that you were going to have neighborhood schools, and you had essentially said at the same time you were going to have segregated schools because the neighborhoods were separate. In 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court case Brown versus the Board of Education had ordered all schools to desegregate. In the mid-'60s, the Portland School Board started a voluntary transfer program. 
but it wasn't long before black children were bearing the brunt of the plan. I was 10 years old, and I was in the fourth grade. Tina Williams and her brothers used to walk to their neighborhood school. In 1968, they began boarding a city bus for suburbia. You wanted to fit in, but you really didn't know how, because this was new. And so just being divided into the classrooms, and we were placed at the back of the lunch line. There were names, uh, racial slurs. It was like a foreign country. I just didn't feel like I belonged there. We never had anyone that we could see every day that we could call our role model. You know, it, even if they were the janitor, just per se, you know, well, we know there's a black janitor every day that we can say hi to, that we can relate to. Ten-year-old Lisa Arsenault and her brother were also bust. You're taking me out of my uh, culture or what I'm familiar with because I have to learn my education. But on top of that, I have to learn another culture. I would think it should be a two-way street. I didn't learn about African-American history at all. Um, in fact, you know, even now while I'm taking classes, it's like, whoa, I should have known this, but I don't. Teacher began speaking about where uh, evolution in that we come from apes. And she directed that statement at myself. And I stated that I was taught we were created by God and we did not come from monkeys. And I said, I did not come from a monkey. And I was sent out of the classroom because I made, you know, that statement. And actually what it did is it empowered me because from that moment on, I realized that there were going to be some problems. In 1969, Portland Public Schools hired a new superintendent named Robert Blanchard. To accelerate desegregation, Blanchard introduced a controversial new plan. What Portland was going to do was every year they would close a grade level in all of the schools in the black community and disperse those students to outlying schools in the white community. Grade schools were K to eight. They would close the school down to remodel. And when it would reopen, it would be K to five. And it was happening again and again. Once you hit sixth grade, you were gone. You, there was no school in your community you could attend. You were on a bus, and it got so ridiculous, they even sent some of these kids out in cabs. Yeah. Kids from King would go to 30 or 40 different schools, so they could go into their neighborhood and, and not know any of the kids there, really, from school, because they didn't go to school with them. They went to school in a different place. The plan promised to create middle schools in the neighborhoods, but there were no assigned middle schools for black children. We're going to scatter them all over Portland. And we're not even going to try to keep them in one concentrated middle school. And their parents were required to sign agreements that they would go to the corresponding high school. So once your child went out, it went out to a middle school, and then ag by agreement, that child continued on to the high school associated with that middle school, which meant your kid never came back home. If your eighth grade is closed, you don't have a choice about where you go to school. It was not voluntary. It was mandated by the Blanchard plan. As the lower grades were eliminated, classrooms emptied, and the space was converted into early childhood education centers. Black kids who lived across the street from these schools who were in kindergarten or younger, they couldn't get in because these spots and these spaces were reserved for white kids who were bused into these top-notch preschool programs. And by the way, when these white kids got old enough to go into the first grade, their parents did not have to sign anything saying, you're going to stay in this school in the black community. They could go back to the west side of wherever they came from and go to school. So that's integration. By the mid-1970s, 
the school board was poised to close the predominantly black Jefferson High School. By that time, the black community had decided that enough was enough and in opposition to the Blanchard Plan materialized and took the form of a group called the Community Coalition for School Integration. The main uh, concern of the coalition has been equity, that all members of our community share equally in the burdens of desegregating our schools. The coalition suggested busing both black and white children in a two-way system, but the school board dismissed the idea. If you can't listen to a citywide group that has studied this issue thoroughly and put forth reasonable and very modest recommendations, you just say, no, we're going to continue doing business the way we were. Well, it's time to take a different approach to this. In 1979, the Portland chapter of the Black United Front was born. Ron Herndon, already a prominent advocate for school equity, wasted no time challenging the dominant white status quo. We wanted to hit that head on. This is the Black United Front. The leadership is black. Everything we do is open to the public. You can come, you can participate, but you're not going to call the shots here. At the point that we knew we were going to have to come public, there would have to be identifiable leadership. Somebody said, well, I think it, it should be Reverend Jackson and Roddy. And we both looked at each other. This is a truly an odd couple here. <laughs> they respected each other, let's put it that way. He said, uh, Ron could cuss them out if he wanted to, but he said, I can't do that. <laughs> it wouldn't look good in the pulpit. <laughs> but uh, but they, they had a real good understanding and a very good friendship, the two of them together, and they made a good team. The most unique thing that the Black United Front was able to accomplish was a melding of those two traditions in the black community. The religious one that had always been prominent in the black community and the new militant approaches that had emerged in the 1960s. Now those came together in a single organization, which was something completely new in the racial dynamics of Portland life. And because it was new, it was going to be much more effective than anything that had appeared before. The Front demanded an end to the forced busing of black children, a middle school in the black community, and much more. Number three, we recommended extensive curriculum changes that would accurately reflect black history and culture, and also upgrade the academic quality and content of the curriculum. If teachers are going to teach your children they have to understand your culture. You have a history that's worth studying. If they don't know anything about it, doggone, it's time for them to learn about it before they dare teach our children. The Black United Front is saying, we're not interested in desegregation per se. We want to control and we want to make sure that the product we deliver to those students, wherever they are sitting and whoever they are sitting next to, is going to be a quality product. Education reform meant working toward a quality, non-racist education for all children. Black children, certainly, but all children. The Front held a strong bargaining chip if their demands weren't met. We're going to boycott. We will boycott starting day one in September if you don't do this. The decision would propel the largest grassroots effort ever seen in the city's black community. The resentment was at the boiling point. It was absolutely at the boiling point. And I think in the beginning, it was uh, Blanchard who said, responsible Negroes will not pay any attention to this. As, uh, knowing the black community as well as he did, the responsible Negroes will not, okay, great. The responsible Negroes grew from 100 to 200 to 300 to the last meeting, 1,000 people who turned out. Over the summer of 79, tense negotiations with the school board played out publicly. It was just a pressure cooker of criticism and politics and uh, difficult interpersonal relationships. I can remember meeting till like two or three in the morning once. We were meeting late and we were arguing and fighting. New board members like Steve Ewell and Herb Cawthorn, closely tied to the Black United Front, began building support for the Front's demands. If a school's all black, why is that different than a school that's all white? We were trying to say black children should be treated totally equally with white children. And that meant you had your own neighborhood school. But as summer was ending, plans for a boycott were heating up. 
So their efforts to divert us, well, we'll give you a little bit of this, but not that. And we said, hell with that. This whole hog. The strategy paid off. Days before school started, the board agreed to revise its desegregation plan. So the front tentatively changed its plans, too. The steering committee of the Black United Front, listen carefully now, recommends that the boycott be deferred for 12 weeks. Catch this now. Deferred for 12 weeks so that we can make sure that what's been talked about is actually being practiced. School board said, okay, we're in uh, mandatory busing. Okay, we're going uh, to change the policy, allow black teachers to teach in schools the black community. Okay, we'll begin efforts to develop a curriculum that addresses black history and culture. Okay, we agree to establish one middle school. But by early 1980, the board's new plans were falling far short of promises made. It became very clear they were just stalling. And we felt this way, that these were agreements that were made, we're not gonna let you back out of them. And we're gonna make it uncomfortable. It won't go forward. Business as usual is not going to occur with the school board. Ronnie Hernan and the Black United Front were starting to push and, and Herb was starting to push on the board. Uh, we were beginning to fight with the superintendent. The whole system just began to kind of crumble a little bit. And a one-day boycott was no longer deferred. In Portland, Oregon, that historically had such a small black population, nothing like that had ever been remotely conceived of as a part of the educational issues here. So in that regard, boycott, an old strategy, an old tool, is a traumatic experience for the larger Portland community. And it's going to really uh, be the focal point of the racial agenda in Portland for years after that. In June 1980, the school board fired Superintendent Blanchard. He died of a heart attack five months later. It was a, a very personal, a very hostile, a very emotional kind of battle that took place because Blanchard became uh, what for many of his supporters was a martyr to these educational issues of the 70s. The school board had been run for certain groups of people for many years, and they were losing that power. And I think a lot of that was the power loss versus this, versus only racial things. Uh, the racial things were part of it, but the power loss was, I think, much greater in terms of upsetting people. Herb Cawthorn and I sat down eventually and wrote up a desegregation plan which mirrored what the Black United Front was asking for. One of the basic things we did was just free up the idea that you could go to school in your own neighborhood if you wanted. And they got the middle school that they wanted. You all have accomplished some things that I have seen rarely in any city. And that is because of you, not because of me. In the fall of 1980, Harriet Tubman Middle School opened in a temporary Northeast location with a promise to transfer it to Elliott School near the Memorial Coliseum, a move that would disrupt the fewest black students. But two years later, the board decided to put Tubman at Boyce, the only K-8 school left in the black community. And the front said no. They're gonna expect us just to come in, chant, make a few noises for about 10 or 15 minutes, we're not leaving. So that's what we were doing. And I turned around and I saw this look on one school board member's face. It, it had the look of, well, you know, this is entertaining, but we're not gonna do anything. That's when I jumped up on the table. I said, the things, buddy all bets off. Life is not gonna be the same for you or me, and I'm gonna show you which direction it's gonna go. The front shut that meeting down and disrupted the next. By now, the threat of boycott was back on the table, and on a mid-April morning, more than 4,000 black students in Portland stayed home from school. Pressure from the black community had once again forced unprecedented change. Ultimately, 
Elliott was converted into a middle school for those children, which was historic. There had never been a middle school for black children or for children in the black community. To make room, the mostly white children that were attending Elliott moved in with the kids at Boys. It was a victory for the community and the whole idea of fairness and justice. People saw that if we were able to refine and put before the public our goals that speak to the same kind of privileges for black children and other children have in the community, and we are prepared to fight for that, that we can win. The Black United Front had emerged as a powerful voice in the black community. At the same time, relations with the police were about to explode. Historically, there are some racist associations between the black experience and woodland animals like possums and raccoons that go all the way back to slavery time. In 1981, several police officers killed and dumped four dead possums on the doorstep of a popular black-owned restaurant. To me, racism at its worst by police officers. I talked to them afterwards, and they never saw that, the, the race part. Don't fight up! Don't fight up! Won't take no more! Can't take no more! We all fight up! We all fight up! Won't take this no rally more. has been called to notify the police bureau, the city council, and Mayor Agency that we are appalled at the behavior of certain police officers toward the black community and that we want an end to police harassment and brutality against the citizens of Portland. Everyone was embarrassed by the possum incident, but I can't help but feel that the professional police officer suffered the most. They need to know from Chief Baker and myself that we will not allow acts of this nature to debase the dignity of their profession. Charles Jordan was the first African-American elected to Portland's city council. In that role, he served as police commissioner. Have you decided what you're going to do at this point? No, I can't say that until I get the investigation. See, there were, you're, you're talking about 10 officers involved. Now, we know two have come forward and admitted they were wrong. I've got to do what I think is right, and I'll do it based on the facts that I find out in the investigation. Commissioner Jordan fired the police officers involved. This is the most unjustified termination in the history of this city, as far as the police bureau is concerned. So it's a political termination, and I think the commissioner simply bent to the pressures. Arbitration returned the officers to active duty, further insulting the black community. If an officer is going to do something bad, they're going to do something bad. The question is, what do we do about it once we catch them? And that's the real test. And then how do we correct it to make sure it doesn't happen again? That's what everybody should be judged on. For Commissioner Jordan, he had a difficult time with the police after that. You know, they wanted somebody else as the police commissioner, and um, I think he took a very bold, fair stand, but it forever influenced his thinking about police. And I used to talk to him even after he left office, and he felt that that was one of the low points of his life and a low point for the Portland Police Bureau. Four years later, in 1985, the relationship between the police and the black community hit bottom. A Portland police officer killed an off-duty security guard, 31-year-old Lloyd Tony Stevenson, as he tried to stop a disturbance outside a convenience store. It was the chokehold. And it was partly a horrible time because the police felt that they were justified. As the investigation proceeded, Police Chief Penny Harrington temporarily banned the use of the chokehold. But what happened next ripped the community apart. On the day of Stevenson's funeral, two officers began selling t-shirts that read, don't choke them, smoke them. Smoke them is to shoot them. So go ahead and shoot them, don't, don't apply the chokehold. And they would wear those shirts under their police uniforms. That, to me, was reprehensible. That represented the very worst thinking of the police. And I'm not saying all police, I'm saying those police officers who participated in that. There were many police officers who thought it was a stupid, foolish thing to do. A public inquest jury, the first in six years, 
ruled the Stevenson killing as criminally negligent homicide. But a grand jury later decided not to indict the officers. Chief Harrington fired the men who'd sold the T-shirts, but their jobs were reinstated. Looking back, it, it just scarred the whole city that you actually have public servants. A man's been killed, and your response is say, don't choke him, smoke him, and you continue to have a job. Nobody that I know who works in any uh, public capacity could ever get away with that. The black community has never felt that every policeman was a racist. The black community has never been anti-police in the sense that they didn't want a police presence in the black community. Black people only wanted police who stepped over the line, who engaged in egregious behavior, to be held accountable for that. And that's one of the, the primary sticking points of this uh, hostility and this conflict. It simply seems that they have a free hand to do what they will uh, with no anticipation of any kind of sanction or punishment that might follow. How do you begin to heal that relationship? And the police bureau today is struggling with some of the same issues. Is how do you begin to do that? The only way we can do it is by us changing and then going to the community and demonstrating that change and slowly building up that trust with the community, eventually where they're willing to work with us. You cannot save the world sitting in an upholstered armchair. It takes the effort the action, the work, the endurance that exposes the body to fatigue and hurts and exhaustion and pain. John Hiram Jackson. In the mid-1980s, community activists joined a struggle on the other side of the world. In the 20th century, no institution, racially speaking, was as close to the slavery of the 19th century as apartheid was in South Africa. The black majority could not vote, buy or sell land, or travel freely. Oregon and much of the rest of America supported South Africa heavily by investing in the country's businesses. We asked uh, companies to divest their holdings in any organization that had anything to do with South Africa. Portland was one of the first cities in the Western world in which there was a large-scale social movement that said apartheid is something that we can no longer uh, ignore and that the world has to do something about. Portland had an Oregon citizen who was the honorary South African ambassador. Well, we asked him to resign the position. You wouldn't want to be an honorary ambassador of Nazi Germany, would you? Twice a week. Protesters picketed the downtown South African consulate. People who had come out to support our efforts around education reform, you know, people who had shown up at the school district for uh, demonstrations at the school board meetings. These were the same people who were also involved in the supporting the demonstrations around uh, Free South Africa. Uh, we had what became known as celebrity arrest. We got people who agreed to be arrested. Each uh, Reverend Jackson and I led and prayed the first time. At 72 years of age, the Reverend John Jackson was still out front, and the police treated him with the utmost respect. He would have lost his balance if they had put his hands behind him. He said, then we'll have another civil right problem because the people are going to get mad at us for letting him fall. So they cuffed him in the front. And we told the police what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. Isn't nobody going to fall down, kick and scream. You go ahead and cuff and take us on out. Nobody is going to be calling you a lot of nasty names. You've got your job to do. We have our. That's what I meant about community policing. We worked it all out. In January 1985, Portland's Honorary Council of South Africa resigned. He was the first one in the country to resign. So we earned the distinction of making that happen. Congratulations from the head of the National Free South Africa Movement arrived soon after. I remember looking at that letter, and then I, I had a copy of the police report from when um, Reverend Jackson was arrested. And I looked at those two documents, and it was like, this, this is... This is real, you know, we, 
we are a part of something and it's bigger than us. It really is bigger than us.